Hi, I'm Gary, and this is episode 195 of EV Musings, a podcast about renewables, electric vehicles, and things that are interesting to electric vehicle owners. On the show today, we'll be looking at what goes on when new chargers are installed. This season of the podcast is sponsored by ZapMap, the free-to-download app that helps EV drivers search, plan, and pay for their charging. Before we start, I wanted to let you know that plans are proceeding with my end-of-season roundtable. I'm still keeping things under wraps, but if you want a hint, is a good one. There'll be a lack of Y, but lots and lots of X in this episode. X. Just make sure you get that word right. Also, just to let you know, if you want to contact me, the new domain and everything is up and running, so I can be reached at info at evmusings.com. Our main topic of discussion today is installing public charging. Now, most people think that the Instavolts, the grid serves, the BP pulses of this world just decide we'll put charges here, snap their fingers, and they magically appear. But the reality is far, far different to that. Installs can take a long time to complete for many reasons, not all of which are down to the charge point operators themselves. On top of that, the CPOs rarely do the actual installs themselves. They design the site and hand it over to other companies. Now, one such company is Vital EV. And uh, to talk to me about what they do, I'm joined by the head of business development, Dean Hedger. Welcome, Dean. Hello, Gary. Uh, now, I like to start all these discussions by asking my guests their EV origin story. How did you come to the world of electric vehicles? Oh, interesting. This goes, this goes back a bit, actually. My career spans back through many kind of automotive uh, iterations, shall we say. And I, I would say that it started off in the, probably the, the 90s, really, when I joined what was a very small company called Out on Vehicle Contracts that turned into First National that ended up becoming the, the behemoth that is Lex. But I was looking after the public sector customers in those days and there was early adoption towards electric vehicles, things like the Citroen Berlingo Electric and um, <clears throat> the Peugeot Partner. And I was always involved in, you know, helping customers understand innovations in the market um, I remember going to see the Modec vehicle and riding in that. And it was all around those sort of, you know, the, through the sort of 90s and the 2000s. And then I think the jobs subsequently have seen me involved with a Alphabet, with BMW and the Alpha Electric products that we had there. Um, the AA through the developments I put in place around the, the call support for charge point operators. And yeah, and they're now obviously at Vital EV, absolutely at the at the sharp end, helping people build their EV charging infrastructure. So, yeah, there's a bit of a backstory, and it leads me very nicely on to your work at, at Vital EV. Now, I must admit, I struggle to understand the different roles on the charger install universe. I mean, I look at someone like Osprey Charging or GridSurf. And they have charges at sites that they've built and their charge point operators. Then I look at people like, say, Craig Hibbert from EV Civils, and they've put charges at sites, but they're not CPOs. But then I look at companies like ABB, Chem Power, Circuit Control, Alpatronic, and they've got charges at sites, but they're just hardware supplies. And then in the middle of that, there are these companies, which is where I think Vital EV uh, fits. You're, you build the sites, but you're not a CPO. You sell the hardware, but you're not a hardware manufacturer. Talk me through that whole process so I know who sits where. It's difficult, isn't it? Because I, I know what you mean. There's lots of companies in this space with EV in the title, and it doesn't enable people to differentiate what they do. You know, it's not the um, it's never it's, it's not really the Ron Seal approach, is it, in the EV market? With uh, it, it does what it says on the tin, but it it should say it, it alludes to what we do on the tin. But yeah. You're right, Gary. Let's 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 clear the fog, shall I, and then explain a little bit more about what what vitals do. So we are, I suppose, an an enabler to a lot of those organisations you mentioned. So we're an enabler for CPOs to become CPOs and, and operate their network. We're an enabler for hardware manufacturers to bring their products to market. 
and we can they, they can sell them through us to end users. So the vital journey and value proposition goes right from being able to help someone do a site install and survey by understanding their power capability. We can then determine the right kind of charging equipment that they need, then install the equipment for them, commission the equipment for them, and then service and maintain it after that. So I suppose in my automotive world, it's a kind of a whole life solution where we'll help with the, the provision, the, you know, the sale of the item, the service of the item, and during you know, the in-life operations of it. So does that kind of, does that clear it a bit for you? It does. And it then sort of picks up on two sort of follow up questions on that, which is let's, let's put this into a couple of scenarios. So I'll give you a scenario. You talk me through the kind of work that Vital EV would do in that specific scenario. So let's say somebody like a, an ESB charging or a BP Pulse or an Osprey came to you and said they wanted to put a new rapid charging site in somewhere like, oh, I don't know. Mid Wales, how would that work from your point of view? Well, to take you on the journey of what we could do, what we could do for them is go and see the site and and work with them to assess the power capability on the site, and then also understand kind of electrical designs and site requirements. So you can kind of scope out a plan for the. The, the aspirations that somebody might have around that site, okay? And then from that, you can then build out a kind of time-scaled plan of what's needed to make that site exactly what that end user wants, and we would help um, create that. Now, we don't do the civils directly, but we have partners that we would work with. Um, same with, like, the Inno Connections. You know, we would work with partners to help us do that. But like I said at the start, the survey, the installation, the commissioning, the provision of the hardware and the service and maintenance of it is very much all done by, by the vital team. So a second scenario, and, and there may not be any difference on this, but let's take your old employee, the AA. Supposing they came to you and said, we've got the big car park at the Phantom House in Basingstoke. We want to add a load of 11 kilowatt AC chargers for workplace charging. Would there be any difference in the, the work that you did on that? Not really, because you still got to go through the same process in terms of understanding power capability. Um, we have AC charging equipment. Whilst we're DC charging specialists, we do have an AC charger that, that, we, that we put in when somebody wants it. Um, so yeah, I suppose not, not, not really, Gary. It's, it's a similar process, just a kind of different end user case. And I think one of the strengths of Vital is we're able, because of the range of products and services that we provide, there's a, there's a range of different solutions available for different end user cases. So it's quite flexible. And are they, I mean, talk to me about that flexibility. Do you have, for example, this is our DC charging um, sort of medium power uh, offering, this is our DC uh, ultra rapid charging offering, this is our AC 7 kilowatt offering or what, or is, it, is there a reasonable amount of flexibility in that? Yeah, no, absolutely. It, it's, it's flexible in the sense that, you know, from a 7 kilowatt charger right up to, you know, a 600 kilowatt power cabinet, we have got solutions in between. Um, so... We can introduce people into the DC world with the, the movable chargers that we have. Uh, moving through to 50 kilowatt wall-mounted units, um, then you, you know, into the standalone chargers, then through into the hub and spoke systems that are built out from, from, from power cabinets into satellites that dispense the charge. Right, you know, with our DC focus, the, 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 you know, the markets we focus on is very much the, you know, the commercial operators but at the same time we have solutions for someone who just you know wants to charge cars as well so like i said it's all it's having the solutions for the different use cases and that's what we're able to to help people with and and also help people understand what's possible 
Um, we get a lot of inquiries into the business and we're always very quick to try and understand with that person, that customer, what's your power capability? Because there's no good getting into a conversation with someone, selling them the absolute charging dream when they've got no chance of being able to operate that on their, on their site without some, you know, serious investment in power. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Uh, now that does bring up the question of what would you classify as a customer? Now we've already said, you know, if the AA came to you, fair enough, if BP Pulse or one of the big CPOs came to you, but I got a scenario like, for example, for my sins, I've been, um, roped in to be the local council climate champion. And they're making noises to me about, you know, can we get some EV charging in at various locations in the area? Now, if I was to come to Vital EV and say, this is what I want, would you consider me a customer or is there a sort of an in intermediate person I would have to go to who would then contact you and get you involved in all this? No, you can come directly to us. Um, the, the customer base for us is, is really B2B, Gary, any kind of B2B scenario um it can be from a kind of a, a, a retail store to a bus a commercial vehicle depot operator um it's 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 very wide and varied and we've got the right members of the team in place to deal with um you know to deal with the right kind of um organizations that need the service um we, we don't do domestic installs that's just one thing to i suppose call out to, 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 to save any confusion. We don't do charges on people's houses. Okay. That's not our market. And there's many other companies that deal with that, aren't there? So yeah, there is, um, um, but, but we will do an AC wall box in a workplace scenario. Okay. We just wouldn't put one on the side of your house. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now talk to me a little bit about the design aspect of this. I mean, back in the day when, when it was still you know, the Wild West on charging. You could pretty much turn up anywhere, stick a charger in the ground, connect it to the grid and be gone. And those days I would suggest are long gone. You now need to be looking at well-designed chargers, connectivity, canopies, CT CCTV. How does that aspect play into the work that you do? Are you responsible for that or do you take what you're given? No, we will give, we will, we will give advice and guidance on a site design. And I suppose more, more, more importantly, what we're doing is we're giving an electrical design guidance. So, you know, the aesthetics of a site, we are, well, we're obviously we're keen to ensure and we'll chip in where, where necessary on whatever the, the client wants to do <clears throat> and give advice and guidance on cases that we've worked on in the past, you know, <sighs> where to run cables externally, internally, you know, all these kind of questions come up. So we are able to help give advice and guidance and make um, whatever the customer's trying to get into place as suitable uh, for all the use cases and, you know, drivers and types of vehicles that they may want to be charging. Um, but without being too dictatorial, if that makes sense, um, but it is important these days, as we know, and like you say, that the literal land grab of the past and shoving charges anywhere, um, we do try and, and understand from the customers, you know, why do they want to put these charges where they're going to put them? And, and, you know, how can we help ensure that it's the best charger based on the, the footfall, you know, the footfall, the traffic that's going to be passing through? Our good friends at Ionity are putting in a nice 10 charger. Uh, hub about two miles from where I live, which is great for me and great for the local area. Uh, but they've obviously had to go through a planning process and send it through the, the local planning authority. Now I've had a look at all the, the plans on there, uh, cause obviously they're available freely online. Uh, I honestly don't seem to have a lot of involvement specifically in creating those plans. Would it be the company that I of, of uh, engaged to do this, who are similar to Vital EV, who put those together? Or is there a third party that people like you would liaise with to get those plans put in place that, that get submitted to the, for a planning application? For, for, the electrical, for the electrical plans, absolutely, that's something that, that we do. 
exactly. It could be something similar to that. And this is where, like, Gary, you've got the scenario here where nobody does everything, um, but it's really important to understand exactly who does what, which is very much the kind of conversation that we said, you know, we were going to have. Um, we've got a preferred supplier kind of partnership list where what we try and ensure with the customer is the customer has one contact, as in vital, and everything that needs to be managed to enable them to operate their, you know, their site, um, we manage through a, through a project and, and the kind of an, an implementation delivery, which means we bring in the right partners to do the right things. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that, 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 that's the kind of the model that we try and operate to. And we're building that, we're building that list all the time, you know, because there's people coming to market and there's people doing, you know, more things and, and less things, uh, as, as this is, it's still so new, isn't it? It's still so new. I, I find the the danger I think is you, we live in a bit of a bubble, don't we? We live in a bit of a social media bubble, especially I think on our, on our LinkedIn's and the like, where it's only showing you what it thinks you want to see in the kind of world that you exist in, on, in there. I know I talk about EV to friends and people outside the circles, and it's a very different conversation. Very, very different conversation. <laughs> a lot of glazing over of eyes, I would imagine. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, only this week, I was away in a hotel. I parked up, and as I, as I walked into... It was a guest house, right? So, so there's a couple of guys outside waiting for a taxi. They were heading off for a curry. And they said to me, oh, I'm glad you didn't park your Tesla next to my car because it will set on fire. And you're just like, oh, really? Really? <laughs> uh, that's so annoying. But I'm, I'm hearing more and more stories like that. And uh, But that's, that is a topic for a whole different podcast. So uh, It is, it is, it is. I digress, absolutely. But so, yeah, that's the world we're in. Uh, now, what sort of interaction would you have with um, a typical site landlord? Now, let, let me give you uh, a little bit of background with this. I was speaking with Adrian Keane, CEO for Instavolt, and I like to pull him up a lot because the installs that Instavolt do at places like McDonald's, um, they're very, very tight. You know, they're using small parking spaces. And I'm saying, why don't you take an extra parking space to allow a little bit more um, freedom for people to to pull in and get out if they've got wheelchairs and things like that. And he said that a lot of the layout is mandated by um, obviously the parking bays that you need. But for some locations, the planning permission for the original site, so the original McDonald's site may have said you have to have 35 parking places. And if you then take two of those for charging, that's fine. But if you then take a third one that's not available for charging and not available for parking, but it's just one to give you extra space, that invalidates the original planning permission on which the site was built. So do you have those kind of conversations or is that one of the preferred supplies that you were talking about a few minutes ago? Well, do, do, yeah, do you know what? Not that I know of, okay. Um, like I said, I've been in nine months and are heavily involved in the business development side of what we do. Um, if we have had conversations along those lines, it would have been done by the, um, the project management teams, but I, I, I don't know, Gary, do you know what? I wouldn't want to mislead anyone on that one. That's not, that's not something I can give you a, give you a decent answer. on. All right. That's no problem. And uh, now a big thing moving forward, uh, especially with the chem power hardware that you, uh, you like to provide is megawatt charging or MCS. Talk to me about that and how that fits, if anywhere, with the Vital EV plans moving forward. Yeah, I mean, Campero is 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 obviously one of the one of the companies that we uh, whose equipment we distribute, and our understanding is that there are megawatt <coughs> charging systems coming down the line to um, you know to enable that <laughs> excuse me the fast charging and ultra fast charging of I think primarily commercial fleets and kind of long haul long haul truck operations. And as these products come to market, then, you know, we, like I say, we, you can see the example there with, with Kempower, we are working alongside the right kind of suppliers to be able to um, deliver the, the, the needs and the requirements of this to the customers 
that are that are moving in that direction. So I think with Vital having the suppliers that we do, you can rest assured that as you know the innovations hit the market, we're at the front end of you know what those are and are able to deliver them um, yeah through our partners. Now, in your role as business development manager, are you focusing primarily on um, sort of like the, 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 what's the word I want to use? The personal transport. So the people who own the Teslas, the people who own the Eneros and that, or are you trying to focus a little bit more towards um, the, the last mile delivery type of solutions? Because there's a lot more bang for the buck in terms of reducing carbon footprints and, and uh, climate impact if you decarbonize, for example, uh, trucks, which brings us back to the MCS thing we've just, the discussion we've just had. So what, what's your focus in terms of business development at the moment? There's three of us in the sales team. Um, and, uh, and obviously we work for our general manager who is also involved in the, in the sales side of the business. And we've all got specialisms, if you like, in, in different sectors. And that can be across uh, power providers, logistics companies, bus operators, uh, vehicle manufacturers, vehicle dealerships, um, charge point operators, direct fleets. There's a there's a there's a mixed bag, Gary, of of who we in, engage with, and I think it, it I think it's going to stay that way for a while because I think. At the moment, for businesses to put all their eggs in one basket is very, very risky because the market is still very new and it's changing all the time and, and people's power capabilities are completely varied. So you you, you, you can deal with a, oh, I don't know, a retail site, for example, with, with lots of power and then you can see another one with next to nothing. There's very little consistency across the markets so we kind of stay quite broad to be able to deal with um yeah you know the differing needs across the sectors so what's the biggest challenge at the moment in installing something like a, a dc fast charging site is it the dnos and the, and the power or or what what's what's the thing i would say it's people having the power capability that they would like um i, don't, I can't really go into names because obviously it's confidential but um, yeah, I'm seeing people that would love to have a hub and spoke system on their site because it would really enable them to then change their fleet of a hundred bands over to electric as quickly as possible. And they would know they would have no problem charging, but they've only got a kind of like a hundred amps into their site. And you know, that gives them no chance of having that kind of power capability um, that they would they would love. So they are having to go back to the, yeah, to the power providers to have the conversations about, you know, yeah, how much they want and when could they have it and how much it's going to cost them. And, and that is quite a slow process. Now, that's interesting because I've got to admit my knowledge of how the DNOs operate and install is, is somewhat lacking, shall we say. But... Um, is it a case of you've got to go to the DNO, say, I want an upgrade to this and it will go into their, uh, their plan and their, their queue and you'll get it at some point? Or can you go and say, look, I have got a million pounds that I'm willing to give you if you can come and focus on my site now and upgrade the power to what we want? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I've not really heard of that, Gary, either. I've not really heard of any queue jumping or, you know what I mean? I think there's a process and people go into that process with the organization that like you say they join the queue um i don't think it really matters too much on how deep their pockets are at any given time uh, I, I just understand it's all you know it, it's in the queue and and you have to wait and do we know what's causing that queue to to extend out is it the dno don't have enough people to do that or is it that there's too much internal planning that needs to take place or what what's what's their critical path that's slowing them down do we know no, I don't, I don't know personally exactly what that is. That, that, you know, um, is it is it is it simply down to resource? And there's there's so much demand at the moment and interest um, that there's a massive shortage, isn't there? I think of is it substations and transformers. 
Um, I've heard that talked about where there's a long lead time in getting equipment such as that. And, and you hear stories of people saying, you know, they were told by the DNO that they, they're not going to be able to have anything like this for three or four years. And you think that's incredible how anything could be given such a long lead time. But there's obviously some basis of fact behind it. Um, exactly what that is, I, I don't know. But uh, this is where we are, we are focusing on those people where, you know, if they haven't got the power, we will direct them to have the conversations with the people that can help them and, and sort of keep in contact for, for when they can to help them, you know, get delivered what they want when they're ready. And how many times have you gone back to a customer and said, right, look, you want this. It's going gonna, it's gonna to require this amount of power, which you cannot have at the moment. It will take two years for the DNO to bring that in. And when you, when you talk to a customer and give them that information, do they come out and go, right, well, we'll wait. Or how many of them come back and say, right, well, tell me what we can have with the power that we've got at the moment, because they want something, even if it's not what they finally want. Yeah, no, if, it, do you know, it's varied. I've got, I've got a, a, a couple of good examples of exactly that going on at the moment where I've got one organization with, with a hundred amps going into the site, they, 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 they got agreement with the DNO to go to 300, which will give them much more capability, but that's going to take several months to happen, but they will be going down that route. So they're happy to wait. They're happy to wait. Someone else I've, I've got in a site in London was interested in one of our movable chargers. Okay. That, that, that will give, um, 40 kilowatts of charge and, uh, 63 amps of power into it, plugged into a three phase socket. But again, they've only got a hundred amps on their site and they've decided to go for 10 AC chargers with a dynamic load management system that will then ensure that you know, the charge is only distributed based on the power capability in the building because they've decided that will be good enough for them. So they're going to go down that route. So this is what I'm talking about with the different end user cases and being able to have the right products and services for what people want, you know, and what we can advise them that, that they can have. And if we have a scenario where somebody says, right, I need 300 amps, I've only got 100 amps. Can we put a hundred amps worth of things in at the moment that we can go live with and then cable up and do all the necessary groundwork so that when we do get the extra 200 amps, it's just a case of coming in and putting the extra units in? Yeah, you, you can. I mean, we're, tr we're, we're trying to take an approach with someone of future-proofing their operation as much as possible. So all that cabling and an in industrial work that needs to take place. If they've got the plans to go with more power in the future, then let's, let's create the infrastructure that can deliver that now, albeit the power needs to come on later. Um, we have chargers we can offer that are modular, that can have power, power packs and power banks increased over time. Um, so you can get people ready for the power that they don't have, you know, based on the power that they do have for, for the, for the shorter term, the short, the medium and, and, and the long term. Yeah. Yeah. No, we do, we do, we do get involved in that and we do advise around that, but it's ensuring that the customer is, has their eyes open to what those costs could be for them in the future. So it's, and it's all part of that yeah, consultative approach that we, that we take. What is the vital EV business model? How do you make money? Um, we obviously make money on the, um, the, 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 the distribution of equipment. Um, there is the, the manpower. So we, we you know, we're, we're selling out manpower. We're providing service contracts. So, you know, it's, 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 there's a few different areas, Gary, where, yeah, where, where, you know, we're vital, we're vital keeps the lights on, shall we say. <laughs> But on a specific install, are you, are you selling the, the hardware with a markup and providing personnel at a specific rate, or is there a, an overall fixed price and you'll work internally to, to determine how much of that is profit? It, you know, it, it varies. It, it, it varies um, depending on the operation. Yeah, depending on the operation. And what at the moment do you think is the biggest barrier to making your company more successful in the field? 
Uh, biggest barrier. It's difficult. It's, it's, I suppose it's just what challenges are there in the market, isn't it, really, than, 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 than making us successful? Because we've been successful despite the challenges that we're facing at the moment. And, and I suppose that it, it's, it's I suppose not being able to go as, as, as fast as we might want. I think that's the challenge. And it, and it really is, you know, down to the power capability on sites. I would say that's the single biggest blocker in the conversations that I have for organizations being able to, um, to install the infrastructure that they desire, you know, at that point in time. So I think it's just, I think it's simply that, Gary, it's that, it's that not, the not being enough power, um, you know, in localized organizations and situations, uh, at, at this point in time, but it's, it's not really stopping us being successful because we're still managing to do what we can. If, if there was more power, then we'd need 10 salespeople and a hundred more engineers, you know? It, it enables the scale faster. Indeed. Uh, what's the one thing about Vital EV that someone outside the company doesn't know, but if they did know, would make them go, oh, that's interesting? I, I think it's the fact that we can help them stay operational during the life of them operating their, their EV charging hardware. When we're not install and walk away, there's, a, there's, a, there's, there's service support available. Um, on a range of different timeframes, but I think it's that, it's that kind of, we will, we will help people stay operational during the life of their, you know, they're operating the chargers. I know that's interesting because that, that then comes on to the whole issue, which I know a number of charge point operators and, and specific sites have, which is reliability of the hardware that's, uh, or the actual offering that's been put in there. So how many if your customers elect not to take that? Uh, not many at all, actually. No, I certainly, speaking for, for me and the business that I've written, everyone's taken service contracts with that. Because it protects the warranty on the equipment. And that's really important. So people are, they are covered against anything going wrong. Um, we provide a, you know, a 48 hour response service as standard. Um, which gives them the comfort to keep everything operational. So when somebody goes out to a unit and they try and plug in and there's an issue of some sort, regardless of what it is, and they call the helpline and the helpline determine that it's a hardware issue, then there's a process internally there where that gets escalated through to the people in your, in Vital EV who manage that and then that, that triggers a 48 hour turnaround. There's a ticketing system that, that talks to our our job booking system and that notifies an engineer that to, yeah, there's a job needs doing here. The network that we provide is monitored Gary 24 seven. So if there are any issues, you know, that we see any fault codes that are, that are delivered by, um, by the chargers, then we're on them often before a customer even knows and can sometimes rectify an issue online before, before they've even known. And those would be specific hardware errors as opposed to, because I, you know, I had Edmund on, Edmund King for the AA on here, and he was saying that one of the major problems that people have is they can't get chargers to work. So it's not that the charger doesn't work, it's that they, they're not familiar with the payment processing or the payment processing is uh, broken. So if there's a payment issue on a charger, I assume that's not something that will get escalated to your people, is that correct? It, it, it might, but initially, but then it's about where, what we do with the issue after that. You know, it's, it's about escalating to the right source of the problem. Um, you know, if a vehicle's not charging, is it the vehicle or is it the charger? Well, we're, we're certainly able to tell if it's the charger. Um, and and that's, me, that's me flipping hats, isn't it? Because in the AA, we could tell if it was the car. <laughs> now I'm saying we can tell if it's the charger. But yeah, so, so, you know, we're able to tell if it's the charger and, and, take, and take the relevant action. Now, I know that's, this is probably not your area of expertise, but one of the things that I hear a lot of people talking about with um, charges, even ones that work, is, well, it's not giving me the charging speed I was expecting. And we know that there are any number of reasons why, why that happens, but there are 
um, sometimes circumstances where it physically is the hardware in the charger that's that's causing the problem. So presumably, if one of the is it a power bank or a power pack within the charger goes out, you will be notified about that, and you'll know pretty much before. Yeah, power modules. Power modules are the things that um, that can go in them, and um, yeah, we'll get we'll get a fault code or a report that uh, what's gone wrong, and uh, and can deal with a replacement. And is there anything else within the the hardware that will actually uh, track the difference between, can, no, let me rephrase that. I know with some of the chem power units, uh, as a user, I can look and I can say, right, the power's been limited because the car can't accept anymore and or the power's been limited because the system can't provide anymore. Do you get sort of visibility of that? So if there's a number of circumstances where the system can't provide anymore, you may look and go, well, is that because the load balancing is working correctly and that's all that's available? Or is that because there's an internal error that we haven't quite caught at the moment? Yeah, it depends really. I mean, like you say, with the, with the chem power equipment there, that if a power module does go down in a unit, the other power modules will continue to work. So that's where you can see, ah, the charge level isn't being delivered as fast as you think. We can then identify if, if a power module has gone, then there's the reason why, absolutely. It's a question that I haven't asked you that you thought I would ask you. I thought you were going to ask me about my 80s radio show, to be honest. <laughs> Do you want to plug your 80s radio show? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, nine o'clock, mid Sussex radio, Thursday nights. There you go. 80s radio show. <laughs> Tune in. Oh, I've, I've listened. Believe me, I've listened. Yeah. I think you, you're right to ask the questions on what does Vital do? You know, I think that was, that's valid because... When I joined the business, I was asking, I was asking the same, you know, um, when you see it from the outside, you don't realize the depth of the service that's available within. And I think, so that's, it's been good to talk, talk that through. And how many other similar companies, cause you, you said, you know, we've got this situation where people don't know who are in the gaps between the charges and the, uh, the end customers. So how many other companies are there that sort of work in the same field as you do? Well, you're asking someone who works in the business development team, Gary, so I'll say none, all right? There's none. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you for names. Yeah, no. Is it a very old pond or is it actually quite uh, quite extensive? Oh, I think, no, no, genuinely, seriously, it's quite a small pond. It's quite a small pond. There, there's lots of people doing <laughs> lots of stuff, but in terms of um, a robust sales and service proposition, I think we are certainly in a, in a, yeah, in a small pond at Vital. Definitely. Definitely. But evolving all the time, you know, we haven't, we haven't talked about our software that, we, that we've got that, that, that operates the systems now because we are, um, able to provide a range of different, um, hardware solutions. We have a agnostic, um, software solution called Oculus and that provides you know, everything that you would expect from a, from a back office system, um, operating, uh, charge points. And we provide that to our, so all of our customers with a service contract, we, we provide that as a matter of course, so they can see the operation of their charges. And this is my point about enabling a CPO to be a CPO. You know, it's it, the whole, the tools are all there, um, for them to, 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 to use us, um, in, in that way. Right. I think that's all the questions I've got. Um, thanks a lot for your time. Really appreciate it. I think it's been an excellent discussion and I've certainly learned a lot. So, uh, Dean, thanks a lot for your time. No, thanks, Gary. That's brilliant. A couple of takeaways from this discussion. I was surprised to learn the level of influence that companies like this have when it comes to charger design. I was always under the impression that it's the CPOs who decide what they want the site to look like and how they want things laid out. But Dean intimated that it's very much a discussion between the company that will be doing the development and the charge point operators. Uh, of course, the planning authorities have some say in this too. Now, I was also intrigued um, by his comment about the EV bubble that we tend to live in. It is worth remembering that EVs are still only a small part of the whole vehicle ecosystem. Yes, the share is increasing every day, but at the end of the day, we need a lot more of movement before it becomes a majority. His comment about the guys thinking his Tesla would burst into flames is pretty much indicative of that. Anyway, many thanks to Dean for coming on and explaining one aspect of the infrastructure creation, of which I was quite ignorant, I must admit. I learned a lot, and I hope you did too.
It's time for a cool EV or renewable thing to share with your listeners. Honda have just released the Moto Compacto, which is an e-bike with a difference. It's a suitcase. Well, actually, it's not a suitcase, but it looks like a slim white suitcase with wheels, a seat, and a set of handlebars. It'll do 15 miles an hour, has a 12-mile range, and costs a little under $1,000. For short-distance trips over fairly smooth services, it's reasonably practical. For anything else, it's also completely impractical, but very cool-looking. And that's the show for today. Hope you enjoyed listening to it. If you want to contact me, I can be emailed at the new email, which is info at evmusings.com. I'm also on Twitter at MusingsEV. If you want to support the podcast and newsletter, please consider contributing to becoming an EV Musings patron. The link's in the show notes. Don't want to sign up for something on a monthly basis? Well, if you enjoyed this episode, why not buy me a coffee? Go to coffee.com slash evmusings and you can do just that. ko-fi.com slash evmusings. Takes Apple Pay too. I have a couple of books out there if you want something to read on your Kindle. So you've gone electric. It's available on Amazon Worldwide for the measly sum of 99p equivalent. And it's a great little introduction to living with an electric car. So you've got Renewable is also available on Amazon for the same 99p and it covers installing solar panels, a storage battery, and a heat pump. Why not check them out? Links for everything we've talked about in the podcast today are in the description. If you've reached this part of the podcast and are still listening, thank you. Why not let me know you've got this point by tweeting me at MusingTV with the words 80s music, not off. Hashtag, if you know you know, nothing else. Thanks, as always, to my co-founder, Simon. You know, he's just learned to take his electric unicycle downstairs which now opens up a whole new world for where he can go and what he can do. I asked him if he thought there was a way he could learn some more dangerous tricks, like clearing the line of people via a ramp. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I've not really heard of that, Gary, either. I've not really heard of any shoe jumping or, you know what I mean? Thanks for listening. Bye.